love triangle, allegedly, says the Sunday Mirror. So there, there are the papers. A varied, a varied crop this morning, which I guess means it usually does. There's no one dominant story. But with us to review the papers, we've got the actor Roger Lloyd Pack, best known for his roles in Only Fools and Horses and The Vicar of Dibley. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, and then we've got, we've got with us the Guardian columnist. We're delighted to welcome back Polly Toynbee. Polly, how are you this morning? Pretty well, thanks. And uh, congratulations on your new book. Many of that hard talk. And Ian, Ian Dale, political commentator, he's <coughs> here too. Well, we must start. We must start with you, Polly. Ladies first. <laughs> Over to you. Well, the Observer story follows on this whole week we've had of the evidence falling apart. Colin, uh, Colin Powell's evidence, and particularly the British dossier. And now here, brilliant uh, reporter Luke Harding in Iraq goes and looks at one of these so-called chemical sites and finds nothing there but some chopped tomatoes and derelict um, concrete buildings and absolutely no sign of any activity or any chemicals or anything at all. Well, that's hardly a surprise because they've probably moved them already. Well they may have done but even so if, the, if their most up-to-date information is to tell us this week that, there's some, that this is a dangerous chemical factory and it turns out not to be and from this evidence it doesn't look as if it's been moved in a hurry now you just really worry about the quality of the evidence. And the whole thing is going to depend on that. If Hans Blix comes back and says, we really have no evidence, the world will feel one way. If he comes back saying, actually, there is lethal evidence here and it all looks very dangerous, then the world will feel differently. Uh, so these sorts of stories, and very good to have you know, brave journalists going out and going to have a look for themselves, are really going to be crucial to the outcome well, of this There's war. another brave journalist, David Jane Corbyn from Panorama, has been to Iraq and interviewed uh, Dr. Rehab Taha, who was head of Saddam Hussein's Biological Weapons Institute. Since that interview, it's rumoured that she's been murdered. And it's quite clear why. She's um, giving information about modified vehicles that are supposedly carrying these biological and chemical weapons that are going that are all over Iraq now. So it's not surprising that there's nothing in, in these former chemical weapons institutes. I was at, actually at university with this, with this woman 15 years ago, believe it or not. I don't remember her. Um, but she, she learned all she knows about chemical weapons at the University of East Anglia, which is rather worrying. And, and she... <laughs> And she allegedly has been executed? According to uh, Jane Corbyn, she's had a phone call this week to say that this woman's disappeared. She's not the first uh, Iraqi scientist to be disappeared by Saddam Hussein. Whether she's actually been murdered, no one knows. But that's, that's certainly what Jane Corbyn's thinking. Thank you very much. Roger, where are you going to start? I'm going to start with the, uh, uh, the couple of stories, really. The, the, anti the, the, war the protest next, next week, of course, the march on next Saturday, which I urge anyone who feels strongly against this war to go on. Um, and and the, both the, the Independent and the Observer uh, stories focus on um, the, the young people on the march and the fact that um, they've sort of um, never been on a march before. And I, I was brought up at a time when marches were quite common and we used to go as a matter of course on marches and they're much rarer now. And a lot you're, of... you're too young to have done all the master, aren't you? <laughs> no, I'm not, David, actually. Yeah. I, I belie my appearance. I was on uh, <laughs> some of the early order master marches. In fact, I was on the first order march and march. So I, I was... That, that was part of... And, and Mark, there was a report out this week, in fact, uh, uh, which said that it's, it's very important to go on march and that you get a lot of psychological benefit from being on a march with other people who share your your views and it's a great stress also reliever. it's kind of therapy, isn't it's it? It's kind of therapy. <laughs> it's a kind of therapy for, for a lot of people who feel very angry about, about what's happening and, and it's a way of getting that what anger out. What does it actually achieve, believe, though, to go on a march like that? It, well, it makes uh, your presence, but whether it'll change policy, that's, that's a, a debatable point. Um, I think, though, that if half a million and maybe more people go on a march, it's going to make a very strong statement about how people in the country feel about their government having this uh, attitude to, to the world. Public war. opinion matters a lot. If you look at this poll today in the, in the mail, <clears throat> six out of ten people agreed with Nelson Mandela saying Tony Blair is more like the United States foreign minister than the British prime minister. Is this fair? Uh, that's quite interesting. His, his, his personal opinion, uh, his personal ratings have fallen greatly. And the same thing's true in the United States. Public opinion really matters. In the United States, the idea of them going it alone, public opinion is strongly against. They'd have a different opinion if it goes through the United Nations. Uh, I think that's going to be very crucial for public opinion on both sides of the Atlantic. And, and any idea of un unilateral action is just going to be a disaster for both leaders and uh, both countries. 
Not if they win quickly. But that's what they said about the old uh, about the, the Afghanistan war. This is going to be a quick war. They always say that before. We're going to win quick. We're but, going but to go in there. I mean, that's it wasn't point. really it was well. It was it was much longer than they thought it, it was went on for a couple weeks. of months. When I thought, and, and before they started, this would be a quick war, be in there in a week. But it did and do more good than harm, because I've been to Afghanistan recently, and you can't find anybody who isn't absolutely delighted at the removal of the Taliban. I mean, from all, you know, even though the country is in a terrible state, the West has not put anything like enough into it, which is the crucial thing about what happens but, after Iraq. The difference with Iraq is that the danger of it all falling apart afterwards, nobody having a sort of after strategy, well, that's that, what's really but, alarming. Nobody, everyone says we're still discussing that, and you would think they've got that worked out. But, th but let's say that's enough Iraq, Ed, as they would say, <laughs> because we've got a bit of Iraq coming up uh, in a minute or two. Um, so, Ian, what else have you got in addition to Iraq? Well, the, the Sunday Telegraph, again, have uh, an interesting story on their front page about Tony Blair's pledge in his interview with Jeremy Paxman to halve the number of asylum seekers coming into this country by September. This slightly reminds us of the pledge that he gave to end street crime by the end of this September, They're which, of course... to cut it, which well, he did. Well, marginally. Well, no, by the same figures he said he would. Uh, he hit Polly, the target. He didn't do that at all. You know that is not true. And I think it's incredible that he can come out with these pledges, which seem to be just off on the spur of the moment. It didn't seem to have any forethought. David Blunkett is now saying that uh, this promise is undeliverable and that he's treating it as a direction, not a target. And the Sunday Telegraph is saying 330,000 refugees have been ordered out of Britain in the past 13 years, but they haven't gone. They're still here. So the whole system is in a complete mess. It's yes, not, quite well, he, as bad, he, not quite as bad as what it inherited from the Tories, which was, you know, a huge backlog, a computer calamity created by Anne Widdicombe, an were, absolute 30, disaster 000, of a system. 30,000 asylum seekers a year in 1997. There are now 100,000. That's nothing to do with the Tory government. It's a lot to do so with wars to do around with the, the wars world. The wars that we're conducting mm -hmm. and, and, and creating uh, the amount of asylum seekers. But why does this what country you, what, get far more than others? That's, that's the question, because we're seen as a soft well, touch. Not well, here it does. well, it's an honourable position, I think, that we have one of the few countries who have sheltered people who've been, you know... Well, I'm not arguing that. But, 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 the, yes, but the, day, the thing that upsets people is the ones who have failed and, and somehow slip into the community more than 100,000. It's not that yes. they slip into the community, well, it's that you can't send them back because the countries won't take them back. That's the 330,000, you're saying we can't send any of them back? No, a lot of them do get sent back, but you can't send back people to China who won't take them, India won't take them. Uh, you know, a lot, uh, there are lar large numbers of countries. What do you do? Where are you going to put them? Perhaps you want to look at the sort of international them. situation which creates so many asylum seekers that have a need to escape their countries, and maybe the policies that we're using are on the correct... About the genuine ones. Policy. But we can't, we can't take an extra 300,000, can we? Anyway, well, we're a small what, what country, have you it is too. Um, well, I, I feel that, that the Michael Jackson story has, has got to be sort of... Of course. It takes up a lot of space um, uh, in the papers. Uh, Bashir has come in for a bashing, um, rightly so, I think. It's rather it's sort of the poor man's Louis Theroux, I think, in that programme. Well, yes, well, I, I thought he came out of it very badly, Bashir, and I ended up feeling rather sorry for Michael Jackson, who I, I, I rather shared his feelings of betrayal um, about the way he'd been treated, and I think Bashir sort of, sort of getting into his, his, gaining his confidence, and then sort of his commentary over being rather sort of mealy-mouthed. And, and Catherine Flett in, in here supports... Um, story and, and, and the rather um, sort of, uh, knee-jerk reaction of, of, of a lot of the press to, to Michael Jackson, who, let's face it, is rather an extraordinary weird character, but I think not deserving of some of the abuse that he's been a victim of. Well, that, that's um, a, a, word, a word on his behalf, yes. yes. What's your thought yes. for the week? Well, I'm always interested to see that the Sunday Times is yet again uh, having a bash at the BBC. They do this every single week and they're running a campaign. It's one of their journalists is challenging the right of the BBC to levy a licence fee at all. So every week they keep on going. And this is, of course, Rupert Murdoch, who wants to try and destroy the BBC for com purely commercial reasons, who uses his newspapers always to attack the BBC and the very, not just the way the BBC operates, but the very existence of the BBC for commercial it's rather a sort of Berlusconi type operation where you use your newspapers for political reasons and it's pretty disgraceful kind of journalism but every week they have a story um, this week you know quoting people saying the BBC is a cultural tyranny um, and seriously trying to um, dismantle it altogether it is after the NHS one of the most loved yes. British one, of the, one of the most loved brand names and a last thought from you Ian um, 
the cricket in, in Zimbabwe. Ah. The, the Sunday Telegraph have it on their front page. Now, you have to bear in mind here that Nasser Hussein writes for the Sunday Telegraph, so when they write that the England players are going to boycott this match, you might think they've prob probably got it right. So um, I think it's inconceivable that uh, the England players should play in this match. I mean, when, when you receive death threats, and the England Cricket Board withholding this information from the players. Well, it's quite wimpy, astonishing. Though. Why don't they do this on a matter of principle? How pathetically wimpy, so we're frightened about a minor death threat. Everybody gets death threats. Why can't they come well, out it, it, on a matter of principle because, and say we're a because, gimmick? Because they have no confidence in the Zimbabwean police to control uh, the environment surrounding that test match. We've seen what the Zimbabwean police have done uh, with regard to the farms that have been Just as well, they're not being sent out to fight anywhere, isn't it? Well, <laughs> well, there's a good comment here from Keith Waterhouse who says, it's not only sa saloon bar chess prodders who are asking now how we propose to get a war in Iraq together when we can't even de-ice the M11. <laughs> <laughs> Good Thank you all very much indeed. Good luck with your book, Polly. On the front page of Hard Work, it says, every member of the Cabinet should be required to read it, apologise, and then act. So... Thank you. They better get going on that. Um, <laughs> now, what sort of weather can we expect today? Well, with us in the weather studio, 